You ever notice how emotionally stable most characters on Star Trek shows are? They have adventures so exciting, so harrowing, that most of us could barely survive what they deal with on a weekly basis, and yet nothing ever seems to phase them. Well, with one notable exception, and that exception is who I want to talk about in this video, which I am calling Why Barkley Might Actually Be Star Trek's Greatest Hero. To understand what makes Lieutenant Reginald Barkley so special, we need to understand how he's different from most other Star Trek characters. Take Captain Picard, for example. Throughout the TV series and films, the guy is abducted and assimilated by the Borg, zapped by an alien probe which causes him to experience an entire alternate life in the space of less than half an hour, captured and tortured by Cardassians, forced to kill his own clone, and perhaps worst of all, required to endure the prolonged presence of Loxana Troy on multiple occasions. Yet none of it seems to leave him with any lasting negative effects. Picard remains thoughtful, curious, compassionate, even-tempered, confident, and he achieves all of this while not having access to a qualified mental health professional. These characteristics aren't unique to Picard, of course. Almost all heroic characters in Star Trek are like this. Quick thinking, cool under pressure, and extremely emotionally resilient. These folks have got their shit together. They're classic pulp adventure heroes, rock solid, indefatigable. They take everything the universe throws at them, fight through it, and keep going. So where the hell does a guy like this fit in with a group like that? Well, the best way to answer that question is to take a look at the episode that introduced him. It's from the third season of Star Trek The Next Generation, and it's titled Hollow Pursuits. We meet Barkley minding his own business and having a drink in 10 Forward. Geordi walks in and gets in his face, and Barkley tells him to get lost and pushes him across the room. Riker sees this and is like, I've had enough of your shenanigans, Barkley. Shoving your superior officer is insubordination. And assault, also, but let's stick with insubordination. And Barkley drains his whiskey glass, snatches Riker in a chokehold, and he's like, You're nothing but a pretty mannequin in a fancy uniform. Our uniforms are virtually identical. Shut up. You tell Picard if he's got a beef with me to bring it to me himself. And he shoves him away. Troy has been breathlessly watching this whole thing from a table, and now Barkley walks over, and she's like, Finally a real man. But before much else can happen, Barkley gets paged to the cargo bay. He tells Troy, later, babe. And then he says, save program. And holy shit, he's in the holodeck. So that's why this guy we've never seen before was able to smack Jordy and Riker around and almost make out with Counselor Troy. It's just his narcissistic fantasy. Wow, this Barkley guy must be a real jerk. So he goes to the cargo bay, and there's the real Geordi and the real Riker, and Geordi's like, Barkley, would it kill you to show up to work on time for once? And he's like, sorry. And Riker's like, been seeing your name on report a lot lately, Lieutenant. You want to stay on this ship, you better shape up. And Barkley's like, yes, sir. And then he gets to work. He sure seems different than he just was on the holodeck. Barkley, we soon learn, was posted to the Enterprise just recently, and he hasn't really been fitting in. Riker and Geordi discuss the situation with Picard. In fact, Riker asks that Picard transfer Barkley to another ship, citing his history of seclusive tendencies and suggesting that Barkley might not be Enterprise material. But Picard's like, since when are we such assholes? Okay, so he hasn't been a model officer so far, but he still signed up for Starfleet just like the rest of us, right? He's a member of the team. We can't just get rid of him, that's not cool. Picard suggests a more understanding approach. He tells Geordi to work with him, help him out. And Geordi's like, are you sure I'm the best person to draw Broccoli out of his shell? My only close friend on this entire ship is a robot man. And Picard's like, just do it. I shouldn't have to order you to be a decent person. It's the future. I thought we had evolved or something. Also, stop calling him Broccoli. Keep that up and you'll have me saying it before long, and if that happens, you can go back to that reading rainbow shit full time because your ass will be fired and on the street with nothing but the pajamas on your back and the comb on your face. Jordy does as Picard asks. 
He finds Barkley still at work in the cargo bay. An anti-grav sled has malfunctioned, and nobody can figure out why. Jordy speaks to Barkley with kindness and respect. He compliments his work and expresses confidence in his ability to solve the problem. Then Jordy overreaches by telling Barkley to show up for the senior staff meeting the next morning. Barkley goes from at ease and reassured to instant panic. Perhaps sensing that he screwed up just now, Jordy assures him that all he has to do is show up and be a part of the team. And Barkley says, okay, I'll be there on time. Cut to the next morning in main engineering and uh-oh, Barkley's late. Of course he's late. He probably overslept because he was up all night, pacing back and forth in a cold sweat, terrified of the prospect of having to turn up for this meeting. But it's not that big of a deal. Barkley's only a teensy bit late and Jordy's cool about it. Still, the meeting doesn't go well for Barkley. Trying to give him a chance to impress the rest of the team, Jordy puts him on the spot about his investigation into the malfunctioning anti-grav sled. Barkley stammers and stumbles, and Wesley steps in and just kind of runs over him. Upset by the meeting going pretty much exactly how he was afraid it was going to go, Barkley retreats to the holodeck again. This time, he does make out with the holographic counselor Troy, thus using the holodeck in the exact same way most of the show's fanboys would. Meanwhile, in 10 Forward, Jordy is hanging out with Data and Wesley and Duffy from Engineering, and Jordy's like, hey, we need to be nicer to Barkley, okay? We're gonna stop calling him Broccoli behind his back because it's mean and juvenile. And Duffy's like, I'll drink to that. And then his glass leaks all over the place. Data picks it up and is like, Jesus, Duffy, you think maybe your grip was a little too tight? You left a handprint in it, for Christ's sake. The glass becomes another mystery, like the anti-grav sled. And other strange things start happening on the ship as well. Chief O'Brien reports a malfunctioning transporter. The Enterprise unexpectedly increases its speed. But the technical issues, while important, are kept mostly in the background. The focus of the episode remains Barkley and Geordi's well-intentioned but mostly ineffectual attempts to help him. That emphasis on character over plot is a good thing, and it leads to a pair of great scenes. First, there's this scene between Geordi and Guinan, where Guinan empathizes with Barkley's position, listening to Geordi complain that no one likes to be around Barkley because of his nervousness and chronic lateness, then suggesting that maybe she'd be nervous and late too if she thought nobody wanted her around. Then there's this scene between Geordi and Barkley from a bit later in the episode. Jordy has just caught Barkley in the holodeck fighting with holographic representations of the Three Musketeers, made to resemble Picard, Data, and Jordy himself. Jordy thinks it's weird that Barkley would make holograms of people he works with every day, but he can tell Barkley is embarrassed and he tries to be understanding. Jordy's like, hey, I get it. I've spent a lot of time in the holodeck myself. And Barkley's like, oh yeah, I heard all about you and the holographic Leah Brahms. That's why I feel like I can talk to you. Because you know what it's like to be so lonely and desperate for affection that you retreat into a fantasy of your own making and against all reason, convince yourself that it's real. That the imaginary people you've created really love you and that you can love them back. You've been in that broken place. You've touched the same rock bottom I have. And Jordy's like, yeah, but I can show up to work on time and talk to other people without pissing myself in terror. Jesus, take it easy, man. And Jordy's like, Barkley, it's not a big deal. You're just shy. And then Barkley says, yeah, no, you can't understand. I'm afraid all the time. And what Barkley says next is the key to understanding what makes him so uniquely admirable in the pantheon of Star Trek heroes. Because what does Barclay tell Geordi he lives in fear of? Is it the cosmic perils the crew of the Enterprise endures week after week? Is it the Borg, Q, getting trapped in a time loop? No, it's not having anything to say at a party. It's not knowing what to do with his hands. Simple things, little details of social interaction that Geordi has probably never given a second thought. But to Barkley, they are obstacles he has to hurdle constantly, every day. When I watched Star Trek The Next Generation during its original run, I liked Barkley, but he was never a favorite. 
It wasn't until much later, when I watched the show again as an adult and connected with other fans through the internet, that I started to realize how many people love Barkley. I get it now. Barkley is the only major character we see struggling with something that many of us have had to deal with too. And not just for one episode, but as a consistent fact of his life. It's a struggle that almost all of us can relate to in some way, even if your social anxiety is not as pronounced as Barclay's, even if it doesn't intrude on your life to the degree it does on his, who among us has never felt awkward or uncertain or out of place? And ultimately, Barclay's anxiety and awkwardness don't stop him from making an important contribution. He doesn't single-handedly solve the mystery of the seemingly random, inexplicable malfunctions that eventually threaten to destroy the ship, but he does come up with the crucial insight that it must be a contaminant that a member of the crew is unknowingly spreading around that is damaging these various systems. From there, he and Jordy are able to deduce the cause of the problem, confirm it experimentally, and recommend a solution that saves the day. With only seconds to spare, of course, because, hey, it's Star Trek. Barkley helps to solve the problem that threatens the ship by successfully doing what he's been most afraid of. Working with other people. Being part of a team. He continues to struggle with anxiety and self-confidence, but he's also proven to himself and his crewmates that the problems created by that anxiety and lack of confidence are not insurmountable. And, even though he eventually relapses, he even finds the will to turn away from his holodeck fantasies. And come to think of it, that's another great scene. Barkley stands in front of the bridge crew, says it's painful for him to leave them, but he knows it's for the best. And Jordy tells him he'll always be welcome here. I know, Barkley says, that's why it's so hard for me to go. And then he makes his final farewell and says, Computer and program. It's not just a well-played scene, it's an important one for our perception of Barkley. Despite how sympathetic he is, some of his holodeck programs are kind of creepy. They mostly boil down to power fantasies, where the men who intimidate him in real life are made to fear and respect him, while the woman he has a crush on is made to desire him. But there's also a quaint innocence about them, even a poignancy. He reimagines Counselor Troy as the goddess of empathy, who offers not brain-melting, pelvis-shattering sex, but unconditional love and peace. The possibility of pelvis-shattering sex is merely implied, in my opinion. Anyway, that final scene of Barkley saying goodbye to the holodeck versions of the crew downplays the creep factor and emphasizes the poignancy by making it clear that Barkley's main motivation in creating these fantasies involving his shipmates was to create a world where he would be accepted and understood, not ridiculed and alienated. Again, who can't relate to that? Some of Barclay's holodeck programs don't show him in the best light, but how many of us would welcome being judged on our unspoken thoughts, our secret daydreams, our moments of private self-indulgence? Most Star Trek characters are impossibly poised and confident. That's not Barclay. Barclay has to work at it. But Barclay is just as capable and competent as his unflappable shipmates. And Barclay is brave because despite his fears and his doubts, he shows up and he does what he can, and he saves the day. He's a hero, not in the romantic, impossibly noble way Captain Picard is, but in a way that feels more attainable to many of us. Most of us will never be Captain Picard, but we could be Barclay. Some of us are Barclay. At least up until the point when he starts using the holodeck to insert himself into his Star Trek Voyager fanfic. Turning Barkley into a Voyager fanboy? That just seems mean. Hasn't the poor man been humiliated enough? Anyway, this concludes my presentation.
Hey folks, thanks for joining me for this episode of Trek Actually. If this is the first Trek Actually video of mine that you've seen and you enjoyed it, it seems like your type of thing, I've actually made 10 of these videos now, counting this one, so go back and watch some of the older ones. The playlist with all of the episodes is linked in the description of this video, so go check it out. If you dug this one, hopefully you'll dig some of the other ones I've done too. The next Trek Actually video, which will come out in a few weeks after this one goes up, will be a little bit of a departure for this series as it's been so far. It won't be focused on a particular character or a particular episode of one of the shows. It'll be about the Starship Enterprise itself. Specifically, the Enterprise commanded by Captain James T. Kirk in the original series and then as it was transitioned in to the motion picture series and the refit that the Enterprise underwent to get it ready for the big screen and some of the implications of that refit and the changes that it involved. It should be an interesting question to explore and a fun show to do. So hopefully you'll enjoy that one too in a couple of weeks. Until then, take care everybody. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.